Alright people, you may be skeptical, but Kaiserreich dropped another update for China, and it's actually really fun. Of course, nothing comes close to the old Genghis Khan the second path for Mongolia, rest in peace my beloved, but still, we got a reworked focus tree for the seemingly insignificant warlord state of Shaanxi, and while it may seem like they can't do much, the focus tree guides you to be able to take on your incompetent overlord, face off against pretender nations, and secure the Chinese region from external threats and reform a greater China. So today, I'm going to show you my story of Shaanxi, and if you like it, feel free to leave a like on the video and subscribe for my future stuff. Like any great story, I have to start from nothing. My economy is trash, and my army is completely incompetent, with our templates being locked. I mean, we have this quote-unquote veteran division, but looking at this template, I just don't think they're going to be good fighters. Now, there are two men who will compete to rule over Shaanxi, Yang Zhizhan, the current leader who represents a status quo with moderate reforms type of path, and then there is Feng Yuzhen, a more revolutionary-minded soldier who has greater ambitions for this land. So Germany starts a mine nearby, and of course we have to condemn this foreign exploitation, but we condemned it too hard that the entire German economy collapsed, which had some unfortunate consequences for us. But at least we weren't the worst off in China. This opened up a new mechanic for me to use where I can use the Qing Empire to give me bonuses to build Shaanxi up at the cost of giving them more influence in me. Like a parasite, we were going to use them to make myself stronger and then kill them when we were ready. So unsurprisingly, the bromance between Fang and Yan break down and they have to compete over who will control this region. And it's actually pretty cool how the modders use the balance of power mechanic from By Blood Alone to represent the power struggle between the two leaders. Of course, I was going to be more interested in the radical guy, because Hui 4 is all about living out your politically extremist dreams. We nurture local democracy in Shaanxi to guide our nation towards revolution against the monarchist oppression from Beijing. And Fang is going to be the one to lead it. The Fangonomics plan of autarky is just pure genius, and combined with his land reform strategy, it made him the undisputed ruler of this great land. Now nothing personal, Jan, but when you die, you drop 50 political power as loot, so you gotta go. But the economic advisors are pretty chill, so they can stay around. And the army generals, well, they also got great loot on them, so they're gone too. I get this invitation to go to a theater, and upon reading through one act of this, I remembered, wait, I don't play Kaiserreich to read, that's a TNO thing. After some industrial reforms, I get the option to expand my mining operation in Shangzi, and we find out that the Qing are mining resources under our borders. Obviously, I gotta assert some dominance with this new leadership. The Qing don't take me serious, so I make sure that our borders are properly respected. I mean, I'm sure the Qing will understand. Well, at least the Qing were just as unprepared as I going into this war. I just started scrambling to get as much land as possible. I even managed to encircle some units, but as for holding that, that's a different story. You see, just as the Qing weren't that prepared, neither was I because I was still stuck with the starting units and still couldn't change their templates. I had three mills and a dream, to hold out long enough to be able to actually use the equipment I've been building this whole time. But holding was kind of ambitious, so the best I could do was die slower. Eventually, I got to the focus, which gave me an option to decide what to do with my troops, and I really only had one option here since one choice deletes half my army. But now I was free to actually change the templates, and honestly, didn't make much of a difference. I needed to assemble a team. And the National Revolutionary Government was just the guy I needed. And once we had a brief talk with them, they joined against the Qing to destroy them. So for the first time in a while, our units were actually given orders to advance. And now since there were a lot less Qing soldiers to stop me, we were being successful. Things had changed. When I got a pocket, I was actually able to kill the units in it. And apparently, the Qing was also getting vultured from the north by the Manchurians. So, unsurprisingly, the Qing died really quick after that. 
But since I did most of the work, I managed to get the largest chunk of them, which greatly offended the Manchurians because we couldn't even have a week of peace before we had another war to fight. I understand the pain that Qing felt when they fought me. The Manchurians took my supply hubs and I'm just struggling here now. They even started pushing me back. But you see, one thing I've been able to do in this campaign is to adapt. So I just let them push me a bit and now I can encircle them. Things may look rough for me now, but then I can just look at what Germany is dealing with right now and I just feel a lot better. But that feeling doesn't last very long because when I exploit the new weaknesses in the Manchurian line, they call in the Mongolians to attack me. And the best I could do is just set up a skeleton crew to hold the mountain so I just don't die. I mean, I just had to buy myself some time because I knew I could pull off something great. And with some aggressive snaking, I encircled a large part of their army. And now it may not seem like much, but being able to kill this made the war so much better for me. Because after that, the Manchurians just didn't even bother to defend their land anymore. So they were welcomed into my new republic. Okay, just take out Mongolia now, and this should all be wrapped up, right? Wrong. So, I needed to form a team. And with my buddy, the National Revolutionary Government, of course. Now, McQuig thought, just because I was being invaded by Japan, that I'd want to peace out. They completely underestimated how much I wanted them dead at that point. So yeah, I threw the Manchuria front for a bit, but it was going to be worth it. I managed to full annex Mongolia, and... All it cost me was half of Manchuria and some very brave men around Shenyang. Those men put up a good fight though. For over a month they were able to survive in the mountains, but I really couldn't make much use of their sacrifice because the Japanese had this thing going for them called better units, so I'm just taking L after L in Manchuria. But then again, I could just look in the west and know it could just be a lot worse. You see, while I may have been losing in Manchuria, when the Japanese pushed into Mongolia, things were turning around for me. They couldn't supply these units, so I could just push through their lines and surround stuff. I even got one of their dumb tanks. As we continued to modernize the army, I decided to take a risky move to just make as good as a quality army as possible. I mean, yeah, we get minus 50% recruitable population, but we're China, so we don't have a shortage of people. Also, just want to give a quick shout out to Cuba, showing that we aren't alone in our struggle and coming in clutch with the 500 guns while the rest of the world burns. Once again, I used my strat of luring the Japanese in by, uh, purposely losing and retreating from Beijing. All of this was intentional, of course. But you see, once I stopped intentionally losing, I was able to thin the Japanese lines enough to start making breakthroughs. And those smaller breakthroughs resulted in me being able to make, you know, the larger breakthroughs that allow me to get a large encirclement of the Japanese forces against the sea. And with that major victory done, I felt like I could try to do more. I mean, two W's are better than one, but this one was going to be a bit harder. I wasn't going to let these guys die in vain. At least I did finish the pocket along the coast and got some really juicy casualties. The Japanese army was not looking hot after that one. Despite Japan's best efforts, they couldn't kill the spirit of these brave Chinese soldiers fighting behind enemy lines. And I used these men to encircle more Japanese. And with that done, I could start a larger scale offensive in Manchuria. And, you know, I figured at this time, with all that we're doing, that maybe it was about time that the Chinese learn what a train is, because those tend to be pretty useful. By 1941, we were back in Shenyang, and we could properly honor the brave men who perished here a year and a half ago. By this point, the Japanese line had gotten so weak that I was able to blitz through Manchuria and cut off the remaining Japanese forces in Mongolia and Northwest Manchuria. Seems like my war wasn't the only one nearing the end because I'm looking at Germany and they're on the brink. Poor Wilhelm III is in charge now and he looks like he's ready to end it all with the mess his father left him to suffer with. 
At least it was all straightforward from here. With the Japanese army defeated, I could just clean up the remnants of their mainland Asia army in Korea, and once that was done, I focused on their puppet Transmer, who stood no chance against the great Chinese army. With them capped, I just had to wait for the event to peace out with Japan, and I could claim all this newly liberated land for myself. Of course, that meant the Chinese United Front was no longer needed, and I could focus once again on uniting China. Now I thought I'd have to focus the National Revolutionary Government first, but apparently Xinjiang had a bone to pick with me, so I had to deal with them first. But they weren't really a threat to me, so I declared on the NRG shortly afterwards. And they forgot to call on their allies for a bit, so of course I got to take advantage of that. Sadly, when I capitulated Xinjiang, despite me doing basically all the heavy lifting to end the war, East Turkestan had the majority of the war score just for fighting them for so long, so I couldn't even get a single state from them. But, as I'm pushing more into the NRG, I get strange news from America. Apparently, Mexico, who was syndicalist, had capped and taught America. They probably got a lot of help to do this, but I'm just gonna say this was Moctezuma's revenge. So, it was just over for the Entente bros now. At least the Entente wasn't collapsing alone though, the Rights Pact was also gone, and I get treated to a really interesting split in Sweden. I kinda wonder which Sweden will do better in the long run, the Communist Sweden or the Serbian Sweden? At least they didn't get as balkanized as Germany did though when they were capitulated. Reading this event, it really does not fit what's happening in the game at all. Like, the US, not exactly an industrial giant right now, and Japan can really not call themselves a dominant power after they just lost a war to us. But anyways, back to China. Things were getting stalemated for a bit in the war because there's barely any supply here, but those entrenched enemy soldiers don't stand a chance when they get hit by 300 cast bombers. And once they got 500 bombers out the front, they couldn't even put up a fight anymore. Now, there were some remaining warlords who had to be cleaned up, but at this point, we were obviously going to be the leader of China, so we could end the century of humiliation. After that, I could request the treaty ports back, but for some reason, Macau was controlled by Mexico, and, you know, I figured a socialist country would be fine with undoing imperialism and returning land back to their own people, but apparently these quote-unquote leftists are just as imperialist as the previous guys. I couldn't even get East Turkestan, because Russia was going to intervene, and you could guess how willing I was to fight a land war in Siberia and Central Asia at this point, so I let it slide. Yeah, so I didn't get everything, but I've united enough of China to say it was a job well done. And now that the world is watching us, we gotta show how powerful we truly are. And I think it's about time to show Japan what it feels like to get invaded. And after everybody lands, I'm a bit disappointed by this welcoming party. Only having one division to guard the homeland like this really just shows how much I destroyed their army. At least, I give them points though for at least trying to defend their capital, but we all know how this ends. With Japan gone, I could go through and clean up the rest of their faction miners, but I think I'm done with this campaign now. These are honestly the best types of campaigns, taking a small nation with really little going for it, and turning it into one of the great powers in the world. So definitely give this nation a shot if you have the time, and if you enjoyed this video, leave a like and subscribe to see my future stuff. Hope you have a great rest of your day, and hope to see you again another time.